What's up, gangsters? And yes, I did say, what's up, gangsters? <laughs> One of my uh, buddies on Scale Modeler's Critique Group was giving me a hard time the other day because I guess on my last video I opened with, what is up, gangsters? And he thought that was funny that I was like, what is up? <laughs> I don't even really think about that kind of stuff, you know. For me, this is just a way of saying, hey, what's going on, guys? You know, and talking to my buddies in the scale modeling world. But uh, I guess <laughs> people pay more attention to the things that I say than I think they do. Um, sometimes uh, not in such a good way. Um, I, I had a message in my on one of my older videos earlier today where some guy was giving me a hard time because um, I had said something to the effect of uh, I was talking about a particular kind of paint and I was saying that if you wanted really good color matching for your McLaren, Red Bull, thingamabob, F1 car, whatever, that you could find the correct colors with that particular brand of paint. And this guy lit me up. He was like, you don't have a clue about Formula One. McLaren does not, uh, Red Bull doesn't run McLaren cars, and McLaren cars were never orange. <laughs> I'm like, really, dude? This is the best thing you've got to do today is to get on the old interwebs and give me a bunch of shit because I don't know anything about Formula One, which I never claimed to. Anyway, here's what I do know something about. Screwing things up. <laughs> it's like my trademark. I feel like I spend sometimes as much time um, unfucking myself as I do anything else. And that's just part of craftsmanship. I mean, anybody who says they don't ever make mistakes is clearly a liar. Um, and I certainly have never uh, tried to hide the fact that I make plenty of mistakes. I mean, you guys have seen some of them right here on camera. And uh, that's just, to me, that's just part of the journey. And uh, honestly, I feel like sometimes that getting yourself out of those mistakes is one of the greatest skill builders. Um, but what I have not done much of, and what I honestly don't see much of on, on these YouTube model making videos, is document how I fix a mistake. Um, and uh, I think that's valuable. Um, I, if, I guess I wouldn't even really have thought about doing it this time though. Uh, if somebody had not said something about it on SMCG when I posted pictures of said mistake, and um, uh, they said, hey, you should make a video of how you're gonna fix that. So I thought, nah, I might as well. Um, and it's, you know, it's understandable why, it, it, you know, people don't because I don't know about you guys, but when I make a mistake, I'm generally annoyed and all I want to do is fix it and move on. And I'm not really thinking about stopping and taking the time to film uh, the way that I get out of that situation. So uh, anyway, I just thought, well, why not? This is one of those times where maybe it's a good time to slow down anyway. So, without further lip flapping on my part, let's take a look at what happened and what I did to resolve it. Okay, here we go. Here is what happened. As you can see, I have uh, my Industria Mechanica Cosmonaut that I've been working on. And um, I've been uh, forming this wire um, that I've set aside someplace. Anyway, you can see from the instructions here, the wire loops around her and connects to this floating orb. And I chose early on um, what may have been a, a, a terrible strategy, um, which was that I was going to build and paint everything before I formed the wire. Now, that, that may, I mean, when I say it out loud, it sounds really stupid, but the reality was that I was committed to airbrushing as much of this as possible, and I knew that I was not gonna be able to do that effectively, at least I didn't think I was, if it were completely assembled. Um, and none of this stuff dry fits tight enough that I was gonna be able to dry fit it and form the wire before I, I painted it. Now, I think maybe I didn't think hard enough about that. I, I think I could have done some things with tape and, and masking fluid, which makes a good temporary glue. And in retrospect, I, I should have tried harder to 
solve that problem uh, before I laid down even a, a coat of primer. But it is what it is. It's the strategy I chose, right or wrong, I have to live with it. And so, when I was working on forming this wire loop last night, I took a couple of pieces of uh, washi tape and I detacked them on the back of my hand a couple of times and I put them across this area here so that the wire wouldn't scratch anything while I was bending it around her legs. And that was all fine. But then when I wanted to check the, the fit of the wire, I wanted to stand her up and I wanted the wire to stay in place, I needed another little piece of tape to put over the wire and hold it in place. Um, and because I was putting tape on tape, I didn't bother to detack that little piece of tape. But, sure enough, Murphy always shows up at the workbench in situations like that. And a little bit of that tape overlapped and laid across the paint. And when I went to pull it off, even though I was being careful, there was that one little pop, and you can see that it lifted a little chunk of paint right off of her leg. Disaster. I mean, it's in a highly visible area. I mean, it's just, this is like, you know, it's, it's our worst nightmare. But it, 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 it underscores what I am fond of repeating, I'm sure to some people's annoyance, that you can never, ever, ever let your guard down with masking. And I know that there's immediately going to be a, a host of dudes who are going to be like, oh, well, did you prime it? Did you wash it before you primed it? You know, blah, blah, blah. Um, what kind of paint did you use? I, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's nauseating. Um, because, yes, the simple fact is, this is resin. It was clean before I primed it with a good lacquer primer, Mr. Surfacer 1500. And then the worst one is, well, maybe if you had clear coats on top of it, that wouldn't happen. Well, guys, seriously, that's dumb. Because if the paint that's attached to the surface is weak, a clear coat is not going to magically make it stronger. But this does, in fact, have probably a half dozen layers of aqua gloss on top of this paint, which is acrylic. It's K-Colors and Mission Models. Um, uh, and... I've got that, that that aqua gloss on there because I wanted to protect all of this because I knew that I was going to be wrestling with the figure while I did the rest of the assembly. So all of the things that you're supposed to do to keep paint from peeling when you lift your masking tape have been done. But as you can see, it popped off clear down to the resin surface in that one little spot. And look, that's just the reality of these materials. Um, and, and anybody who says that that's never happened to them, because there's always going to be that one guy who's like, oh, I've never had a problem. Well, yeah, sorry, you're either lying or you forgot or you were never doing anything challenging with masking tape or you just got lucky, which is, you know, very possible. But I've had at least, I don't know, I can think of at least uh, half a dozen maybe a, a dozen instances of something like this happening over the last couple of years where I did all the right things and I still had a little bit of lift. And what it comes down to is that really the only defense is peeling your tape correctly. And some people are immediately going to be like, oh, well, it's just tape. What do you mean, peel it correctly? Well, I've done a, I did a video on it, which I don't even remember how many episodes ago it was, but... I'll get a piece of tape and I'll demonstrate what I mean. And this is a piece of good quality MT washi masking tape, which if you're not familiar, washi just means it's rice paper tape. Um, it's what some people very erroneously call kabuki tape, which is meaningless. But MT is the company that invented this washi tape. And in fact, they make at least some of Tamiya's tape. Anyway, lift can happen even with really good quality tape, uh, not to mention crappy garbage tape like frog tape. So you have to peel it correctly, and the correct way is parallel to the surface as much as possible, and very slowly, and usually like at an angle. If you're masking and you've got a paint line, 
you want to peel at an angle away from the paint line. So let's say that this is the separation right here. You want to peel at an angle like this. And that's just a professional painter's trick. That's not a model making thing. It's not some kind of gospel that I discovered. That's an old school professional painter's trick. The bottom line is when you lift this way and you're pulling straight away from the surface, that's when you're going to pop a little piece of paint loose, just like I did here. So uh, you've got to be careful. And the reason that it doesn't happen much with the pro guys who are painting cars and things like that is because the materials that they use are a lot stronger and the layers are much thicker. So uh, it's just not as much of an issue. We are using very thin layers of very fragile paint on top of material that it's never going to chemically bond to all that well, especially with resin. Now with styrene, if you use a relatively hot primer, it's going to etch into the surface of the styrene. And by hot, I mean like a, a good lacquer primer. Um, even Mr. Surfacer 1500 doesn't bond to the plastic all that much. It's better than, better than an acrylic primer in most respects, but still. It's not like a full strength automotive lacquer primer, which, you know, you'd have to be careful with that on styrene because it might etch it so much that it would craze the surface. Anyway, point being is this is the nature of the game we play and lift is always something that you have to be on the lookout for. And that's why I say don't ever let your guard down. Now, anyway, with all of that said, I have to fix this. And I thought that it would be, I don't know, good or whatever, my, you guys might find it interesting for me to document how I'm going to do that um, on video. So that's what I'm going to get to. Um, and basically my plan is uh, that I'm going to level it and then I'm going to sand it very carefully and then I'm going to spray back over it. Um, and it's a little bit of a challenge because it's in an area where the tones go from lighter to darker. So I've got to take that into account. Um, but the first thing is I have to level it. The bottom line is when you have something like this, if you just spray over it, it doesn't matter how many times you spray unless it's just a pile of paint. You're still going to see the outline of that, of that defect. So you have to level it. And under normal circumstances, what I would do is just sand everything down to where it was all feathered in and then respray the whole area. But I'm going to try to keep the affected area as small as possible here because I don't want to get into any of this stuff over here, obviously. So um, what I'm going to do is first fill in the little divot with some paint that's as close to the correct shade as I can get. I'm going to dry that and then I'm going to sand it down very lightly just in that area. Then I'm going to come back and airbrush over it, and then I'm going to come back with some aqua gloss to protect it. So um, that's the plan. The first thing I've got to do, though, is mix some paint, and then I'll fill that in, and we'll come back and take a look. Okay, so first step is done, and it actually went pretty well. Uh, you can see, maybe, uh, you can see that it is much less visible. Um, there's the spot right there. And you can see what I mean by level it out. I basically built that up using paint straight out of the bottle, but mixed to the right shade. And I just kind of had to work it as I went. And I, and I did three or four layers there, so I was able to kind of adjust each time I, I put down some more paint so that I have a pretty good shade match. Um, and who knows, when I sand that, it may be invisible enough that I'll go without even spraying over it, but we'll see. I'm going to let that sit there for about half an hour before I hit it with sandpaper. Okay, so here we go. It's been about half an hour, and I came back and sanded this, and it's mostly fine, but this is a good example of how things sometimes get worse before they get better. So, take a look here. Uh, you can see that I've got it pretty well leveled out, but there's still a divot there. And what happened is that as I was very lightly sanding it with a uh, with an 800 grit UMP thinny stick, that another little chunk of paint just popped out. And you can see that it went clear down to 
the resin. Um, and what that basically means is that there was an area right next to the original chip that was weak that just for whatever reason didn't go ahead and pop off with the tape and it was just waiting to come loose anyway. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, that's just how this kind of thing goes sometimes. And the only thing for me to do is repeat the process and fill in that little area and come back and smooth it down and hope for the best. Okay, so it's about an hour later and I just came back and sanded the area again. And you can see where I'm at. It is, I think, as near as I can tell, and understand that I'm doing all this with my Optivisor on, so I feel like I have a pretty good view of it, but, you know, it's never, it's never perfect. Um, but I think, if this will focus, that I'm in about as good a shape there as I'm going to get. You can see that there's sort of some discoloration there, and what that is is the different layers of different shades of paint as I was attempting to get a good match. And as I sanded, sanded it down to get it flush, that of course exposed some of those to varying degrees. But I think I'm, I'm in about as good a shape as I'm going to get. Um, good enough that when I come back with my airbrush that I'll be able to blend that successfully enough that it'll be very difficult to see. So, that's going to be the next part I'm going to tackle. Okay, so this is the moment of truth. Um, I have cranked my airbrush uh, down to where it's spraying at about 5 PSI. And I just used my trusty Neo for this because this wasn't really about spraying a fine line. So I didn't need to switch to the Sotar. This was about control and being able to lay down a very gradual uh, thin layer and it took me a couple of tries to mix up a shade that I felt like I was confident in. The first try was just a little too dark and needed a little yellow in it and this is a really good case for keeping your custom mixes of paints for as long as you possibly can because you never know, a month or two down the road, you you know, on a long-term project, you might have to, you, obviously you might need it again. But it almost didn't matter because when I had originally did this, I was kind of shading as I went. And I have no real idea of what the exact ratio of green and white and yellow was that I was using right there. So, you know, the truth is you're just never going to get it perfect and you just have to do the best you can. But... You can see that with my Neo, if I can stop bumping the camera, um, that I can do pretty light shading and make that real gradual. And I did it, uh, I did it exactly that way with the airbrush held at a real low angle because what I wanted to do uh, was have it fade off down toward the, the lower part of the leg because that's what I originally did when I, when I, when I blended this area and, and put a little bit lighter shading on this part of it because that was a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more in the direct overhead light. So anyway, um, oh, and I also used a little bit of Panzer Putty to... Uh, cover up this area right here to make sure I didn't get any overspray. Um, you know, I, I don't really know what else to tell you guys about how to deal with situations like this because it, it, you just have to be real surgical and real methodical about it. Um, and even so, you can see that I clearly did not get it perfect because now that it's blended in with color, you can see that there's still a little bit of of uh, unevenness there uh, with the uh, with the height of the patch and that it is not perfectly sanded um, and I'm not happy about that and I'm pretty tempted to go back and sand it again and and try again but here's the thing with acrylic paints especially, there's a point of diminishing returns where you can't sand them down infinitely thin. Um, you, you end up 
you know, creating a little bit of a tear. And that's what that edge is right there that you can see on the, uh, the bottom of the patch. Um, so what I'm going to hope for is that I can come back, uh, that when I come back in and cover all of this with aqua gloss, that I'm able to uh, maybe do a little bit of gloss and sand right in that area and level that out a little bit better where it doesn't show. But, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of that that I'm going to just have to probably live with. Um, and I'm really, really fighting the urge right now to pick up a piece of sandpaper <laughs> and try and make that better. But... Um, that that's when that's when things usually start to get the stupidest is when you can't fight the urge to try and do even better and it's it's just a case of the better being the enemy of the good um, because there really is no way to get a totally perfect blend on something like this um, when when you're working at such uh, you know, microscopic level. Um, it's just, it's just very, very difficult to do. And that's why the best strategy for fixing something like this is to never have the problem in the first place. Okay, so here we go. It's a few hours later. Uh, it's evening and I have done the final step in the repair. Uh, you can see that things are looking pretty smooth there right now. Um, it's not a hundred percent perfect, but I really feel like that um, after um, I've done the rest of my oil paint shading and given this another couple coats of aqua gloss in the, all of the green areas and then come back and given that a uh, a final flat coat that it will be all but invisible. The last thing that I did was I spot varnished the area pretty heavily with some aqua gloss and I and I worked quite a bit around the spot and did as much as I could to kind of build that up and get it all leveled out and get rid of it, get any texture filled in and then I just came back with a uh, with my UMP 800 grit sanding stick and just very lightly leveled that out and then came back in with the UMP buffer and uh, gave it a, a quick rub down and uh, it's, I'm, a, I'm as happy as I can be under the circumstances. Uh, it's, it's tough to make a spot repair like that and have it, uh, and have it disappear so I feel like, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm doing okay and maybe I've dodged the last bullet on this project. Okay, so there you go. That is business as usual at Rube Goldberg Enterprises. Stuff happens, and you got to fix it. Um, that's just the way it is. Hopefully, uh, you guys found that sort of useful and informative, and uh, maybe it will help you feel a little bit better uh, next time something like this happens to you, because not only will you know that you're not alone, but you won't panic, um, because you'll know that if you're just methodical about it, that pretty much anything can be fixed as long as you're willing to take the time. So, um, as always, if you guys have uh, put up with it this far, I definitely appreciate, appreciate you watching. Take care. Much love.